computer. Okay. Um, and most of you are familiar with Cameron. He comes to us from uh, the Genetic Literacy Project. Um, he had written for us before joining the organization. And now he is hosting our weekly podcast. Um, we're hoping to build an audience. Uh, podcast is going to focus on one of our big articles for the prior week. And uh, he and the uh, guest will dive deeper into the issue that was covered. Um, so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Cameron. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the media covers pesticide safety and pesticide regulation these days. Um, if you're familiar at all with this issue, you know that they, they follow a pretty standard narrative, uh, and it's usually wrong. And uh, it goes something like this. So Greedy Company X develops synthetic pesticide Y. The chemical works so well that farmers become dependent on it, um, but there's a catch. The chemical is actually very dangerous, and the only reason we know this is because some intrepid activist or lawyer or journalist uh, exposed the dark underbelly of whatever company made this, this chemical. So you'll see stories, and I have one in particular in mind. This is from The Intercept. This is the website that Glenn Greenwald set up back in the day. Uh, the story is called The Department of Yes, How Pesticide Companies Corrupted the EPA and Poisoned America. Now, that's just one example, but CNN runs these stories, uh, HuffPo, uh, NPR, any mainstream corporate news outlet runs these kind of stories, several, several each year usually. Um, they typically run around the time that Environmental Working Group releases its Dirty Dozen. But I wrote a couple of stories last year trying to help people understand when they're reading these because typically they're not good reporting, they are uh, ideological activism but they're masked as, I'm just a reporter telling you the facts. Now we can't go through all of these one by one and refute them point by point, but there's a handful of uh, characteristics that they all have in common. So if you see one of these or you see several of these, it's a good indicator that you need to double check what you're reading um, because you're probably not getting good information. So most of these stories have several things in common. Um, the first is that they lack nuance. Um, they employ double standards, they rely on bad research, they selectively cite experts, and then finally they, they rely on what I call or what other people have dubbed the banned in Europe fallacy. So I want to take these in turn and the idea being um, with the stories that I wrote, I want our readers to understand this. And for, for you guys who are, who are really driving our work, I want you to understand that, you know, what we're trying to do to get this message out to people. So, let, so let's take these in turn. So um, most of these stories, they lack nuance. And what I mean by that is they don't understand the significance of pesticides in, in public health. And uh, let, me, let me quote for you Dr. Henry Miller. He's a former FDA regulator. He's a current advisor to ACSH. So he wrote in a recent story for the Genetic Literacy Project, by any of the standard measures of public health, reductions in mortality, impairment, and infectious diseases, as well as improved quality of life, the contribution of modern pesticides has been profound. Now, I, that's probably not a surprise to, to this audience, but most people would be shocked to hear that. And I would probably go as far as to say pesticides are in the same range of impacts as vaccines or antibiotics, um, or even basic hygiene. And here's a few examples of why I think that's the case. So there are, uh, well, I should say it's very common for uh, insect damage to um, lead to the development of mycotoxins in crops like corn. And when these mycotoxins get into the food supply, they can cause acute poisoning, they can cause immune damage, and they can cause cancer, uh, particularly esophageal cancer. So if you look at certain countries in Africa that lack access to pesticides, you can see noticeable increases in the rates of cancer because of mycotoxins. So with pesticides, of course, you can kill the bugs before they do any damage. Um, or if you have genetically engineered crops that contain the BT toxin, um, it has the same effect. So this is a really big deal. This is, I mean, there's all sorts of ways this impacts public health, but uh, healthcare costs and, um, you know, people who are sick, they don't live healthy lives. They're not contributing to society. They're not raising families. They're, they get sick and they die, which is tragic. Um, the classic example, of course, is using DD, uh, DDT to kill um, uh, malaria vectoring mosquitoes. Same thing with pyrethroids. These are very, very important insecticides, especially in the developing world. But maybe most importantly, 
is the fact that insects destroy our food before we can harvest it. And there's, as we're talking right now, there's hundreds of millions of people who don't have enough to eat. Now, the technical term is food insecurity. That's a little stale for, for my liking. I just call it hunger and in some cases starvation. Um, and when we have access to an, an abundant supply of safe pesticides that are effective, we can feed more people. That's just the bottom line. So no matter, no matter what any group, any activist group, any, any, any social justice warrior, because they're starting to jump on the anti-pesticide bandwagon. This is just a scientific fact. Um, so the first takeaway here is that <clears throat> if you see a story written by somebody that doesn't understand the value of pesticides, you need to be very skeptical because people like this, they see the world in black and white. There's, there's bad companies, there's good activists, there's bad chemicals, and then there's good regulators, provided they haven't been, you know, corrupted by, uh, you know, the big evil corporations. Um, I, I, I've joked before that the way these people think, it's sort of like an episode of Captain Planet, if you remember that cartoon from uh, back in the 90s or the movie Aaron Brockovich. You know, they, uh, this narrative is so powerful, this underdog narrative. Um, people will apply that to real life. And if there's facts that don't fit, well, you just shave off the rough edges and kind of you tell the story because it's compelling. Um, but as critical thinkers, we need the public to recognize what they're reading because this is almost always false in some very important way. Now, these same journalists who, who love this narrative, they employ double standards to keep it afloat. Um, and they will also rely on bad research. So let's look at these as well. So in these stories, and the intercept story is a great example, um, thousands upon thousands of words to the dangers of pesticides, to corruption at the EPA, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Almost none of them will mention uh, chemicals that are used in organic farming. So copper sulfate is a, is a very common example. It's widely used as a fungicide um, in organic agriculture. Same thing with uh, spinosad, it's an insecticide widely used in conventional and organic farming. Um, but, but these generally get a pass because organic food has sort of a health halo in the minds of these urban journalists. Um, now, the European Chemicals Agency says that copper sulfate is very toxic to aquatic life. It can have long lasting impacts. It may cause cancer. It can damage fertility and it may harm unborn children. That's a direct quote from the European Chemicals Agency. Um, Spinosad has been studied pretty thoroughly and what, what recent research has found is that even in sublethal doses, it can damage the metabolism, the bees metabolism, which messes with their foraging behavior. Um, and so misused or overused, these chemicals are very, very harmful. And these reporters who claim to be, you know, sticking it to the man and fighting the people who are poisoning uh, the, our natural environment, they don't, they don't mention these. And it's primarily for, for ideological reasons. Now, what they will go after, of course, is glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. They will also go after a class of insecticides called neonicotinoids. And it's, it's almost like they've inverted the, the pyramid, if you will, because, and, and you may know this already, but glyphosate has been so thoroughly studied, they've basically run out of studies they can do on it. There's just no other way to look at its, its health effects. And I'll point you to a recent report. This is from the European Union's assessment group on glyphosate. It's an 11,000 page report. Um, they looked at every possible health risk that's been associated with glyphosate and they found nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, reproductive toxicity, carcinogenicity, anything you can think of, there is just not good uh, evidence to support this in the literature. Um, and with neonicotinoids, what the research has shown is that these are actually a significant improvement over the previous insecticides that were used. And this is primarily because they're applied to seeds as a powder coating. And if you just Google neonicotinoid, you'll see this if you're not familiar with it. But they coat the seed, they plant it, and then as the plant grows, it releases a little bit of this insecticide. So it kills the, the insects that are trying to destroy the crop. Um, but it's, it's relatively harmless to beneficial insects, especially if it's not a flowering crop because the bees don't go near it. Um, and when, you, when farmers lack access to these, which we've seen in the UK and in the European Union recently, it devastates their yields. So um, in the UK, for example, they grow um, rapeseed or canola is what we would call it here. Um, and they've, they've suffered tremendous damage. And the UK actually had to rescind its ban on neonicotinoids so farmers could recoup some of their losses. So these are very useful chemicals. They're relatively safe, um, but the journalists, 
ignore the ones that are more toxic and they focus on the ones that are a tremendous improvement. And so this either betrays a tremendous ignorance of how pesticides are regulated and how important they are, or they're just misleading their audiences. And, and of course, the, the hip term these days is disinformation. So if we want to say that reporters are spreading disinformation, they're not following the science, um, this, is a, this is a terrific example. And when it comes to the research on these, they will, they will I, I think a lot of journalists, and I say this as, as a science writer myself, I think a lot of these people, they think of the peer reviewed literature as this like canon of truth, you know? So if you can go onto PubMed and you can find a study that says uh, glyphosate may cause cancer in rats, well, then this is gospel and we can apply it to the, the story we're writing. And of course, if I want to ignore something like the agricultural health study, which is a, an ongoing epidemiological project that monitors the long-term health of farmers, uh, well, that's fine. You know, I can throw that out because I found this, this animal model that's useful to my agenda. Um, now, they may not consciously think that, but that is what they do in practice. And so we can't do that, right? We have to look at all of the evidence. We have to look at the quality of the research, and then we make a decision. Um, and they generally don't do this. And the Intercept story was a great example. They did this with glyphosate. They did it with neonicotinoids. Um, and we need to be uh, aware of that as, as critical consumers of this information. Uh, along the same lines, they will selectively cite experts. And I think that this one is the funniest, in my opinion, and, and I'll explain why. So uh, in the Intercept uh, story, for example, they quoted Charles Benbrook, who's an agricultural economist, and Nathan Donnelly. He's a, he's a bona fide biologist. He's got a PhD, and he works for a group called the Center for Biological Diversity. So these two characters are a lot of fun. Let me, let me tell you why. So Benbrook um, in, I believe, 2014, there was a FOIA request released from the University of Washington, where he was at the time. Um, and he had, he had been paid $100,000 by the organic food industry, in his own words, to ramrod studies through the peer review process. So he went and found journals with, with a low impact that, that don't have very tight peer review. Uh, and he published studies about glyphosate and about the benefits of organic products. Uh, and his check cleared. So they published his study. Um, and he's also a, uh, he's a private consultant now. He's not at, not at a university anymore, but he is frequently um, an expert witness for plaintiffs in lawsuits against pesticide companies. Um, now, the way The Intercept describes him is a veteran agricultural economist who follows the behavior of pesticide companies carefully. What they didn't say is that he's getting massive payments to, to be in court. <laughs> so the, it's kind of amusing to me because um, these stories are all geared towards ideological and financial conflicts of interest that are, that are poisoning this discussion. And the way they know that is they talk to other people who also have ideological and financial conflicts of interest. And presumably because they are on the right side of the issue or they're, you know, they, they, they hold views that are in line with the current progressive state of things it's okay, you know, they're allowed to get paid by the organic industry because they're good, you know, their intentions are pure or whatever. Um, and that's just hilarious, right? That's an obvious double standard. Now with Donnelly, it's, it's interesting because Center for Biological Diversity primarily makes or raises their money by filing lawsuits to um, restrict access to pesticides or to, you know, get certain regulations in place. Um, and then they go to their donors and they say, look at this great work we're doing. You know, we got this regulation reinstated. You should support us. We're doing all this great stuff. Um, but the way his organization is portrayed to the readers of The Intercept or HuffPo is like, oh, they're just this well-meaning group. You know, they're fighting the power. They're fighting the people that are trying to poison the environment. And this is just so misleading. You can, like, you can't tell people that this guy is just out there, you know, fighting along. That's not true. And let me give you an example. And this goes to our last example with the banned in Europe fallacy. So in 2019, Donnelly published a paper um, pointing out that there are 85 pesticides that countries around the world have banned that are still allowed here in the United States. And the implication is that we're behind the times, you know, our, our regulatory framework is outdated and it's, you know, it's been captured by, by the industry, this and that, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and, and, the Intercept reported this and, and you're just supposed to, oh, I'm so shocked. Why are we using these pesticides? Um, now, when you look at the paper, it becomes a little more clear. So here's a few things to keep in mind. Um, he points to the European Union, which is more strict on, on their pesticide regulation in some instances. Uh, but 
The problem is Europe is, or has been for decades, caught in the grip of the precautionary principle, which basically says, um, if you can't show that something is safe with a high degree of certainty, then we're not gonna use it. So they have good regulators, they have good scientists that will do good risk assessments of the chemicals that are available, like glyphosate is an example, but the politicians under the pressure of some of these activist groups and from voters who, who are ideologically aligned with them, they will ban these chemicals. So it's not that the research has shown that a particular pesticide is harmful, it's that there are political considerations. And uh, Donnelly also points to China and China, China will, will ban pesticides willy nilly in some cases. But of course, this is a, a totalitarian communist regime um, that locks people in their apartments, literally by welding their doors shut. So the fact that a, a regime like this bans a product or it silences people and knocks down their social credit scores so they can't participate in society, these are not good examples to use. Now, of course, he doesn't explain any of this in his paper. That's left for, for people like me to do because you need this, this vital context. And, and parenthetically, I thought this was amusing. Ben Brook was one of the reviewers on Donnelly's paper. So you have these guys doing pal review of each other's work. Now, strictly speaking, I don't think that's um, disallowed by these journals, but I think it's, it's informative to tell your readers, if you're a journalist, hey, these guys, they work together. These are not independent uh, guys that just happen to have the same view. They are often working towards the same goal. Um, now, more to the point about why these pesticides are still allowed in the United States. If you're not familiar with this, you can go to the EPA's website. They have a 21 chapter pesticide registration document or book. And it basically outlines every regulation that you have to comply with as a pesticide manufacturer to get a registration to sell your product in the United States. If you're ever having trouble sleeping, just crack this baby open, read a few paragraphs. I promise you'll hit the pillow very, very quickly because it's so technical and so boring and so monotonous. Um, but, it, but that's for a reason, right? And that the reason is that the EPA, for all its flaws, and it does have a lot of flaws, um, it doesn't want to approve pesticides that are dangerous because if anything, it makes them look bad. If they approve something and it hurts somebody, this does not uh, make, make regulators look like they're doing their job. So the point is, is that if something is approved in the United States, it's been thoroughly studied. I mean, the, the, the research you have to do to get a, an approval it takes many, many years. It costs many millions of dollars. Um, and when these pesticides do cause harm, it's usually because they've been misused. So for example, in some countries, um, people will use pesticides to commit suicide. So if you think of a weed killer like Paraquat, um, when it's used by a licensed pesticide applicator, when it's used according to its EPA registration, it's safe to use because there's precautions in place. Now, if you drink it, it's acutely toxic and it will kill you, absolutely. Um, but a lot of countries, what they do when they, they come across this, they say, well, we're just gonna pull this off the market and then it'll be harder for people to use it to commit suicide. But what Donnelly and others like him will do is they conflate use on a farm and use to do yourself intentional harm. And they leave their readers to assume that people are getting sick and poisoning themselves because farmers are using this chemical. And that's not even remotely true. So this has been dubbed the band in, the band in Europe fallacy by a handful of scientists. And it's been called that because anti-vaccine groups, anti-GMO groups, all, these activist groups, they basically will say, look, you know, this, this vaccine is, is not allowed over here. This crop is not allowed over here. And then people are just left to assume, oh, it, it must be bad. And this, of course, is highly fallacious reasoning. So, so as we wrap up, and then I'll be glad to uh, take some questions and, and chat about this if, if you guys are interested in. But, but as we wrap up, I just want to just want you to keep a few things in mind. So, and I say this as a journalist myself: you cannot trust what the media says about pesticides until um, specific writers and specific uh, news outlets have proven their reliability to you. You just can't trust what they say. You have to double check everything because discussions around issues like this are so polluted with ideology that you're probably not gonna get good information in one way or the other. So double check, you know, if you see something on HuffPo, go to our website and type in the pesticide and chances are good we've got something on it um, that will correct what you've heard. But I think 
the most important thing to remember is that we have to take a balanced view of pesticide use or, or what, I, what you could call a both and approach. So pesticides can be both very dangerous and essential to a sustainable food supply and to promoting public health. And that's just the reality of the world we live in. You know, yes, chemicals can be very dangerous. Yes, companies can do bad things on occasion. Uh, regulators uh, can be foolish and they can be misled and they can, you know, they can be even corrupt in some cases. But the reality is they also do a lot of good work. And there are a lot of scientists and a lot of people, even at these companies, who have children, you know, or they're farmers on, on the side. And you have academic scientists in the same place, you know. These people don't want everybody to get sick. If anything, if you want to be cynical, that's just a bad business model, right? But we're all humans. And I think we have a desire to see flourishing for the, for the most part. So I think that understanding that requires a broader perspective. It requires realizing that there's uncertainty in some cases and that the world's not black and white. This is not a Julia Roberts movie that we live in. But uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for your time. And if you have questions, let's, uh, let's chat. Hi, I'm, I'm going to show I'm Raina. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm trying to get my video up. I'm fairly incompetent. Here we go. Hi. Hello. Um, so you had we're talking about that. Um, you know that if we don't that if we don't use pesticides, the, the insects destroy our, our, our crops before we can harvest them. So with with people who are writing that that insecticides are dangerous. What is, what is their alternative then? Uh, a good question. I, I don't think they have one. And that's one of the problems is that they live in, typically journalists who write for these outlets, they live in big cities, they're in an urban environment, there's food on every corner, um, and they're not really exposed to the issues. The chances are good. They've never met a farmer. They've never spent time on a farm. Um, if they do reach out to a scientist, it's someone like Nathan Donnelly, they, they wouldn't reach out to um, a researcher like Kevin Folt at the University of Florida, for example, and say, hey, can you, can you fact check this stuff for me? Um, so I think in their minds, organic farming is the solution. And it's great because there's no or there's a little pesticide use. Um, and this is the way forward, right? And it's just, as I said, it's this, it's this ideological narrative that does not consider the facts. So the short answer is, they don't have an answer and they don't see the problem with that is, is what I think. Uh, Cameron, this is uh, Mick Hitchcock. Um, I was um, fascinated by your, your concepts here and, uh, and the two things, I, I work in the pharmaceutical business, I've done for years, and, and a lot of things are focused around the concept of risk benefit. So you've got to look at not only the uh, benefit of a drug going on the market, but also the risk. And I mean, I, I think in the, in the same way here, when you, when you look at a, uh, a product that's designed to kill, um, you know, pests, um, then obviously there's, there's going to be at some level, there's going to be some risks. And, and it's a question of, uh, you know, do the benefits of, offset the risk? So I think that's one aspect. And then uh, the other piece, and uh, you, you got into it a little bit, but uh, I'd also value your uh, perspective. There's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of ambulance chasing lawyers who are, who are looking, <laughs> looking for the opportunity um, to sort of provoke something, even if it's not true, because they make money out of it, right? And um, I mean, the glyphosate thing has been, uh, um, you know, a terrific example of how they've been able to make a lot of money out of something that really isn't a, a problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, I, I just wrote a story about this recently. It's, it's on our homepage right now. Um, I'm actually hopeful about the glyphosate situation. Um, you're right. They, it's, it's a lot of junk science they've made or they're going to make billions of dollars by the time all these cases against Bayer are settled. Um, but that legal strategy that they run, um, they call it tobacconizing an industry, right? It, you run out of steam after a while. And the, and the reason is you either run out of clients because there just aren't enough people <laughs> who have the disease in question, um, or you start losing cases, you know, like at some point you run into a jury that goes, you know, I don't know about this. It, like they overplay their hand and this happened last year. So Bayer won 
in October and in December, I think they won back-to-back -back cases against people who claimed that uh, glyphosate caused their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, one of them was a younger girl. And so they were able to convincingly argue in court, there's no way she's been exposed to enough of this, assuming it does anything. And the jury said, yeah, you know, that makes sense. So now that they've got two victories on the books and the cases that they lost um, are now reduced to damages and they're appealing to the Supreme Court. And if the court steps in, Bayer's argument is, well, the EPA says this doesn't cause cancer. So if we put a label on it that says it does cause cancer, which states like California are mandating, they're in violation of federal law. So the Supreme Court could step in and say, hey, that makes sense. No more. These cases are dismissed. No more can come to any, any US court. Um, so that that gives me encouragement. You know, if if you're Bayer, you got to write big checks for a little for a little while. But um, this this approach it just doesn't work after a while. So they will they will indeed they'll move on to Paraquat. They'll move on to to two four D. They'll move on to other pesticides. Um, but I just don't I just don't think that's sustainable over the long term. Cite the example of your friend at the hardware store. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, so let me tell you this really quick. Um, I was shopping at Home Depot a few months ago. I was in the home and garden section buying some fertilizer or something. And I was standing next to a guy and he's looking over a bottle of glyphosate really intently. He's looking at the label. He's looking under it. And he looks over at me and goes, isn't this the one that causes cancer? And I just said, no, the lawyers made that up. He goes, oh, OK, thanks. And then he puts it in his cart and, and walks away. Um, and I told that story as, as, as part of an article I wrote. Um, about a, an anti-pesticide activist. And she was lamenting that no one pays attention to her work anymore and nobody cares about glyphosate. And I thought that was a terrific anecdote that shows people are over this. You know, I mean, the, the pandemic, of course, took people's attention. But the reality is, is that we have no evidence that glyphosate causes any jump. So if, if the pesticide doesn't cause the harm you're claiming it causes, People just run out of anxiety and stress and they, you know, they have kids to raise and, and bills to pay and they just have real problems. And so they, they kind of tune you out after a while. So you, you mentioned a little bit about um, neonicotinoids. Um, there, there was a big um, level of enthusiasm at one stage for thinking that it was uh, decimating the bee population. And uh, uh, e even though I think the evidence was showing that uh, there, were, there were plenty of bees at that point in time, could you comment around uh, how, how, how the science around that has evolved? Sure. Um, well, first I would recommend uh, John Entine's writing at the Genetic Literacy Project. He's covered this very extensively. He's got very detailed articles. Um, he talks to the experts at the USDA and, and various universities. So if you want to understand this in depth, um, talk to him. But basically, the short answer is that uh, years ago, there was this concern about colony collapse disorder. Uh, you had colonies that uh, the bees would just flee. They would just leave, and no one understood why. And I, to my understanding, it's not quite clear why that was happening. Um, but overall, what the research has shown is that um, honeybee populations are uh, remaining stable or increasing despite increased use of neonicotinoids. Now, the reason for this is that honeybees are basically managed populations. They're like cows, you know, they're agricultural animals. Um, now, that doesn't mean they don't face any, any risks. It doesn't mean that pesticides are good for them. Um, but what it means is that we're not like drenching the earth in pesticides and killing these, these natural, beautiful creatures. That's just, that's just not the reality. The biggest threat to honeybees uh, is an insect called the Varroa destructor mite. And this is well documented in the literature. Um, and the activists, they tend to ignore this. Some of them have actually given up on it. Uh, I forget the exact group, so I won't say who it is. But one major activist group basically moved on from this narrative because it was so blatantly false. And they started talking about wild bees um, as, you know what I mean? Like they just moved on, they found a new, a new boogeyman really. Um, but that's basically where the research stands. There's one entomologist who, who put it this way, I forget who it was, but I'm paraphrasing. He said something like, if there's a top 10 list of threats to bees, pesticides are number 11, just to put it in context. So um, there, there's really no good evidence 
for that. You know, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be responsible stewards of, of this earth that we have, but uh, you know, the, the, the fear mongering is unjustified. Anyone else? Cameron, you're um, you're very courageous <laughs> to tackle these problems, and um, I appreciate virtually everything you write for the council. <laughs> I read them all, and um, it it discourages me that that a company like Bayer, which I know quite well, can be so damaged by false. Uh, suits and false allegations. Is there an association or a society out there, a professional one that that can join your bandwagon and 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 really talk the science more effectively, broadly? There's a pretty good coalition now of of which we're a part. So, uh, Genetic Literacy Project, which I've mentioned, they do yep. really good work. That's where I, that's where I was the managing editor there before I came over here. Uh, the, the Alliance for Science at Cornell University does really good work in this area. Um, Kevin Folta, who I mentioned, we do a podcast together. He's really on the front lines of the science communication effort. I don't understand how he does it. He goes on Twitter and he finds people that are spreading nonsense. And he just, he says, hey, that's not right. Let me explain this to you. He calls it a science hug. So he's always very nice and very respectful. I just, I can't, I just can't do it. <laughs> but, but all that to say, there is a growing coalition of, of groups that are loosely affiliated. We have our own missions and our own, you know, our own goals, but we work together on these issues. And in the last 10, 15 years, it's made a significant difference. And one of the things I've been writing about is how the GMO debate is basically winding down for one of the reasons I gave earlier, which is that the, the, the fear mongering just is only so effective, right? You can only say GMOs are gonna destroy the earth for so long before people go, uh, you know, I'm going to go have dinner with my family. I don't have time for this anymore. You know, so it, it takes a combination of telling people the facts, being respectful of their concerns. One thing I stress is that we need to stay out of politics. A lot of people in science communication, they love to wrap up their ideology, their ideology with science. It's totally destructive. It's the worst thing we can do. But I think we're figuring that out slowly but surely. And so we're seeing some progress. The, the, the other thing I think... Okay. Oh. Do you subscribe to science, the journal Science? Um, I don't subscribe to it. I, I have access to it if I need to. Um, but I generally find the way uh, academic publishing works these days to be just egregiously unethical. <laughs> so I try not to give the money unless I, I have to. Um, but, but I can't access it. I, I, but maybe you had a follow-up question to that. Well, I do. Um, it's uh, probably the most widely read scientific journal out there. I think it's number one. And I read it every single week, cover to cover. At least I span all through all the titles and look for anything that's particularly of interest to me. Mm -hmm. I notice that the editor of that journal always has a commentary, I'm going to call it. He basically gives his opinion. And He's misled about half the time. <laughs> and I would think trying to watch his editorials and maybe feed him uh, some improved versions might be a <laughs> wide scientific community. Um, he's, he's a very articulate writer, but he's often on the wrong side, in my opinion. And I'm yeah. not talking just politically, I'm really talking about the, you know, the viewpoints he expresses. But he's um, a shaker and mover for sure. So I would encourage you to see if you can see his topics and get through on any that you find particularly useful because he he is a, a power power person in a powerful position to hit the media. So anyhow, just a thought. Yeah, I, I will. I will definitely look into that. Um, because I, I did a couple of stories recently about the Lancet, which is in a similar position in that they're openly calling for, for physicians to celebrate Karl Marx, you know, to guide their, their practices. And they're talking about uh, everyone eating a vegan diet. And, uh, you know, we need to abandon capitalism because it's destroying the planet. These are not scientific arguments. They have no business 
being in this space, frankly, as a peer reviewed journal. So that's an important topic. I just want you, your comment prompted me to think of uh, Thomas Sowell's book, Intellectuals and Society, he's an economist. And, and you're probably familiar with him, but he, one yes. of the points he makes, one, he, one of the points he makes early on in that book is that academics are surrounded by other academics. So the only feedback they get for their ideas are people that think just like them. So they will say things to each other like, yeah, you know, it'd be great is if we toppled capitalism, it came up with the whole new socio-political system. That would be great, Steve, great, great idea. You know, so, so when they're talking to each other, this is the only feedback they get. And then when they present these ideas to the world, they get a mixed reaction because people like me say, what are you talking about? Biologist, you know, <laughs> what are you, this is not, this is not what you should be doing. Um, so that's the problem. And that's why there's value in the work that we do, because we will say um, it's okay to have opinions. Everyone votes, everyone has a political ideology. But when you're talking about the benefits of, you know, a, a certain tool of agriculture, shut up about how you vote because it's not relevant. I just wanted to add that I think one of the things also that is helping the public see more clearly about the benefits of GMOs, the benefits of pesticides, the benefit of herbicides, is the fact that we have a pretty steady food supply, not just in this country, but around the world now, um, as a lot of the developing nations are changing their minds and allowing GMOs and allowing uh, these chemicals to to help them with their agriculture, they're actually feeding themselves. They're becoming self-sustaining economies. Um, and at the same time, these journalists, as one of our writers pointed out, I don't know if it was you, but the journalists at the same time were saying that this is creating a new colonialism because we're making these people more self-sufficient. Um, I mean, the absurdity of journalists is just uh, unreal. But I think that has helped with a lot of people's thought processes about the benefits of the agricultural system that we've created. 100%, 100%, because the farmers in these, these developing countries, um, when they grow more food, when their yields get better, when they have to spend less on fertilizer and pesticides, they go, oh, this is, this is a benefit to me. So you have all of these wealthy activists here in the West who, and, and Tom's right, they, they will say that uh, big uh, pharmaceutical companies, too, but they'll say pesticide companies and seed companies, they're trying to recolonize Africa. And the absurdity of this is just so ridiculous because for one thing, uh, what they're actually talking about is trade. If you have a farmer and a company that sells seed and they both want to make an exchange, this is the foundation of a, of, a, of a free market. And it's the foundation of global trade, which we know makes everybody better off. And in the last, the last of our discussions here, I used the example of uh, last year I bought a Toyota. It's a great car. I'm very happy with it. But Toyota is a global corporation. They have way more political influence and way more money than I'll ever have. But I'm not oppressed by Toyota because I bought one of their cars. And it's the same thing with agricultural products. So not only are the, the journalists are a part of this, but, but not only are they, they spewing silliness on the scientific front, they're actually advocating for restricting access to these products in the name of, of keeping and I kid you not, they make this an explicitly race, racial issue and they say, you need to keep white Westerners from imposing their, 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 their post-enlightenment scientific knowledge on these people who have indigenous ways of, of knowing. Now, if you talk to those people, they go, you know, I know, I know we, the way we grew things and I haven't forgotten my heritage, but I want the stuff that you have because it works better. <laughs> and with GMOs, a lot of them require less water in their growing process. And that's very beneficial for the developing countries because water supplies are always at critical levels. They just, they grow more efficiently, you know? So if you have a crop that, that um, is, is resistant to damage, then yeah, it's, it's, it's healthier overall. So that's a great example. There are some, um, some crops in development that are specifically um, drought resistant or they, they, I don't know if that's quite the technical term you would use, but they grow with less water, um, different, different varieties of corn and so forth. So yeah, I mean, the, the innovations are almost limitless. It's really a matter of um, letting the research go, and for, go forward and getting consumers to accept that these products are safe, which is happening more and more over time. Hi, um, oh, this is Nancy. I was just gonna make a comment. Um, 
about two things about the the move to CRISPR to alter organisms um, in a way is changing the way they talk about things. You know, you're not crossing a some animal into another one, and that would make people think you're really, you know, creating monsters, <laughs> so to speak. Right. Right. Um, so I think just talk, that the talking about CRISPR to audiences might make them feel a little bit better about uh, modified crops. I don't know. Um, but the other po the point I wanted to make was about litigation and how um, decisions are being made. I was part of the silicone breast implant panel mm -hmm. that was drawn together by the judge in the um, Birmingham Dist district, I think it was a long time ago, back in the 90s. But it seems like the way that worked after the reports were out and everything, that the issue kind of went away. And, you know, they decided to follow any, any woman that chose to have a breast implant after that was in a, a, a um, cohort that was followed over time. And, you know, the issue kind of went away. And I'm wondering why there aren't more um, science panels, or expert witness panels brought into some of these big lawsuits anyway that that might help um keep some of the the bad science out of the testimonies yeah uh great great points on both fronts um regarding regarding CRISPR I think there is some value in talking to people about that um but there there's a potential mistake on the horizon in, on the horizon in trying to separate gene editing from the older technology like transgenics. Um, because if you try to avoid that discussion entirely and you try to say gene editing is different, you're implying that there was something wrong with the earlier stuff, which is not true. And uh, Hen Henry Miller, who I mentioned earlier, he's very adamant about this. So he's made the point, and he's not alone. There's a lot of academics saying this too. He's made the point that plant breeding is plant breeding is plant breeding. You know, whether it's whether it's crossbreeding, whether it's CRISPR, whether it's transgenics, whether it's mutagenesis, where you're bombarding a seed with radiation or chemicals, yeah. you are inducing all sorts of mutations. And the newer technologies that we have are much more controlled and more precise. Um, so you actually have less to be scared of. But but the, the way the activism has distorted this conversation is we, we've, as a society, we've learned to think, oh, the older stuff that actually causes more mutations is safer. And the newer yeah, stuff uh, is is a greater yeah, risk. Before. Okay. So that's not really um, that's not really the case. So so the point is is that you start with CRISPR and you say gene editing is a great technology. Here's it work. Here's how it works. And then you argue backwards to transgenics and you, yeah. and you point out that DNA is DNA. It doesn't matter if it comes from a fish or a cow or uh, a head of lettuce. It, you know, it's all the same. Yeah. <laughs> all the building blocks are the same. Yeah. Um, I agree. So yeah. yeah, so it's not easy, but but that's probably the better way in the long run because you don't want to you don't want to argue on the other side's terms. You want to yeah. totally reframe it. Um, on the lawsuits, it's a perennial issue, and there's not a great answer to it. I do know that in the settlement that Bayer proposed for these lawsuits, um, as part of that, they wanted to set up that kind of a panel um, that I think is going to follow uh, prospective plaintiffs or people that are already in the class action and oh. see if, if they develop it. So um, the, again, the Supreme Court could nullify all of this. I don't know if they will, but if, if they don't do that, Bayer's plan is to say, let's set up the science panel. We're going to follow people. Um, we're going to settle the existing cases for, for four and a half million dollars. Uh, we're going to pull glyphosate out of our lawn and garden products. So that's going to reduce the risk as well. So they have this kind of multi-point strategy to shut this down. Um, and of course, they're going to get better because they're probably going to have to fight these at some point. Um, like Syngenta right now is dealing with uh, probably a few thousand lawsuits now related to Paraquat. So I think the industry is going to get better at fighting these as time goes on because mm -hmm. they have more experience with it. Um, that said, I, I I don't know. I mean, it, it's any, anybody's guess what what a court's going to decide or you know what what a, what these groups are going to do. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah, I think one of the issues ultimately is when you get to court, um, the, the the juries aren't necessarily the uh, the people who are best qualified to make a decision about whether something is caused by a chemical or not. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm from the uh, 
from the attorneys to want to set up a, uh, a panel that really doesn't understand the issues very well because yeah. then they're more likely to win the case. Yeah. Oh, that breast but, implant was, was the one that I was involved with was settled um, out of court yeah. at the end of the process. Well, one of the glyphosate judges, um, when it was back when it was Monsanto, when Monsanto wanted to introduce evidence that showed that there were more studies showing the glyphosate was safe, more studies um, that actually showed that the one agency that was being used uh, as justification for saying glyphosate caused it caused cancer was IARC. And they wanted to submit that one of the advisors to IARC was paid by the lawyers that were actually taking the company to court. The judge will not allow that to be introduced to the jury. So, you know, that's that would have blown the plaintiff's case out of the water, but that wasn't allowed. It was, but you are right about juries. I had a friend that sat on a jury in Fairfax, Virginia against Eli Lilly for a drug they had uh, produced. And when the trial was finished, they, the jury went to deliberation and it only took about four hours of deliberation. And uh, they said that uh, Eli Lilly was not guilty and uh, they exonerated him. But they said they still felt Eli Lilly should give this plaintiff some money because they had more than she did and it was only fair. So, I mean, <laughs> and the judge said, sorry, you can't do that. You said they were innocent. It's, it's done. Um, but uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, Excuse me. I, I had a question, which, and I'm sorry, I had to drop off for a bit because of another engagement. But the question that I always had is, and, and I've served on a couple of juries, but the problem that I have is what it's, it's all in the judges, the what the judges allow as science. Um, and as a, somebody sitting on the jury, they make the judgment call that, well, if we hear it, then it's got to be real. And mm -hmm. so if a, a, the judges, sometimes I hear they say, well, I'm not sure that this science makes any sense. I'll let the jury hear it. But that's actually putting the thumb on the scale because once the judge says the jury can hear it, the jury gives it validity that maybe it doesn't deserve and the judge should have thrown it out at the beginning. So that's always been my problem with these cases. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to watch how, how a court proceeds. You know, there, there is the Dalbert standard, which is supposed to keep garbage science out of the proceedings of a court. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I don't know why, like in, in a lot of these glyphosate cases in California, the presiding judge is Vince Chabria, he's an Obama appointee. And at certain points, he seemed to be skeptical of what the plaintiffs were saying. And he would, he would tell them, you know, you need to be a little more rigorous about what you're telling the juries. Um, but at other points, he would let stuff into, into the case or in, into, the, into the trial. And I just I couldn't understand why you would do that. I mean, um, Tom gave the example of trying to bring in more evidence that glyphosate didn't cause cancer, but there's all sorts of stuff. Like there, there are some quotes that have been floating around the internet and uh, these the activists have taken them out of context. They're from scientists at Monsanto and they're exchanging emails and they say, uh, you know, we can't say for certain that glyphosate doesn't cause cancer and they will snip off that part of the quote and then they publish that and then they, present that to the jury. Now, if you read the rest of the quote, it says, um, all the evidence we have suggests that it doesn't cause cancer, but we just can't with certainty say that it, that it doesn't. Now, if you're familiar with science, that's how scientists mm -hmm. talk, right? Their, their conclusions are um, probabilistic. They're statistical analyses of whether something is, is likely or not. So it's not that they're saying, this probably does cause cancer, we need to hide it. They're saying, as far as we know, it does not. And I, I don't know why, but these were used in public. Uh, activists like Carrie Gillum, who was until recently with US Right to Know, former Reuters journalist, she would write about this in The Guardian. Um, other people would write in other news outlets. And these quotes are out of context. So as far as, like anybody reading these papers is a potential jurist if they're in California. So if they see this and then they go into the court, their understanding of this issue is already polluted. And and to, uh, to the earlier comment, uh, people with an academic background, people that understand these issues, they will not be allowed on these juries. And uh, I was talking to a scientist uh, a couple of years ago. 
uh, who was called in for jury duty and it was related, something related to chemistry or, or um, pesticide safety. And they said, okay, sir, what do you do for a living? He's like, oh, I'm an extension scientist. I work with farmers in my town. And they said, okay, thanks for coming in. Dismissed. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, they don't want people with that sort of background. Um, now, I, I could understand if you have like a background in law enforcement and the case is related to, um, you know, potential crime that a police officer has committed. I could understand you not wanting that person on the jury. <laughs> but if you're talking about pesticide safety and you have access to a bona fide expert who's not related to the, the details of the case, let them in. You know, you want informed people uh, guiding these decisions. But can they keep those people off the jury? And, and what is it called that pre, pre um, that they have a number of people they can they can kick off without cause. But is that is that cause to allow a, a plaintiff's uh, attorney to kick somebody like that off the jury? I, I honestly don't know. You'd have to you have to talk to a lawyer. Okay. About that. Or what, maybe what, maybe Tom knows. What what other question relating to this stuff? I thought in cases like this, you needed you couldn't the jury couldn't kind of make the judgment. It had to be proven that this caused that. If it wasn't clear, then they couldn't find for the plaintiff, but it's not sounding like what the standard is anymore. Well, for, for a civil trial, the burden of proof is not as heavy as it is for a criminal trial. Oh, preponderance of evidence. Right. And it's a much lower standard. Right. Mm -hmm. Or more likely than not, right? 51%. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. It's interesting because what does that mean? That probably means something different to different people, you know? This is why you have regulators review this stuff. You don't have, you know, Joe Smith, who uh, is a plumber or whatever. And I'm sure he's a great plumber, but you don't want him <laughs> determining yeah. whether or not a, pest a pesticide is safe or not. Any other questions? Okay. I well, thought I'd go back to Cameron's comment about okay. uh, about uh, capitalism uh, and uh, basically saying that you know that's like saying uh, let's do away with capitalism because we think it's bad. You know, let's do away with water because it kills so many people. <laughs> you know, I, I, water just is. Capitalism just is it's it's the name of a of a result so you know they're trying to change the english language yeah yeah it's uh it's absurd i'm a and in, in my spare time i'm a hobbyist economist i love reading uh murray rothbard and ludwig von mises and hayek and all these guys thomas Sowell, as i mentioned um and the, the lack of economic understanding in the sciences is just mind-boggling because you have people who they understand genetic engineering, they understand the value of this, these technologies, but they will say just absurd things about, about markets and about how economies work. And it's, it's devastating. Some of, them are, some of them are better than others, but especially people who work in the developing world, they, they see uh, capitalism as an evil. You know, This is part of the colonialist legacy. And again, if you know the first thing about economics, you know that that's ridiculous <laughs> because you know, trading is not colonization. You know, if you march your army into a country and you take it over, okay, lad, let's call that colonialism. But this idea that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer and I'm in Uganda and I want to buy an insect resistant seed from, from Bayer or whomever, it's none of your business, you know? <laughs> so go find, you know, get an honest job, go pick peaches or change tires and stop, stop lying to people about this technology. Well, you, you're being nice to economists. Most economists don't know anything <laughs> about <laughs> economic stuff. And that is a result of using the Samuelson economics book uh, yeah. for, uh, God, I don't know what, it's been at least 40 years and probably closer to 60 years that that book has been the mainstay. And it is just wrong. Yeah. Yeah, Keynesianism is a blight on, uh, on the profession, I think. And and there you go. Yeah. Absolutely. And he actually admitted that it was wrong. When he was <sighs> debating Bill Buckley, he admitted that it was wrong. Or he was Oh, wrong. interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, if you want to go back into the history of where 
He got his information. He was not a trained economist. Uh, that's not, we don't need to go there yet. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, if you want to read a very deep book about leftist thought, there's a book called uh, Leftism Revisited by uh, Eric von Kunin Ledeen. Um, that book took me longer to read than any other book I've ever read um, because it's so complex, but he goes all the way back to the Marquis de Sade when he's talking about um, the socialist juggernaut. Um, and uh, it's, it's really detailed and, uh, but was well worth the read. Um, but anyway. All right, so I wanna thank everybody um, for joining us and gotta figure out when the next meeting will be it may not be till September, I'm not sure yet, because I know people are on vacations in summertime, it makes it kind of hard to do this stuff, but uh, I'll try to get one in um, before September. But uh, again, I thank Cameron again, and uh, everyone here for joining us, and have a great thank rest you. of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much, you. you guys. Have a good one.